Tochu presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. Welcome to episode 201, the second of 2022. My name is Dave Roberts. With me is my partner in this endeavor, writer, journalist, dog mom, owner of the Georgia Virtue, Jessica Salaji. Hi, Dave. Howdy, howdy. How are you feeling? I'm doing well, except the legislature's back. But other than that, I'm well. Yeah, uh, they they all had their chance to, to go to Indianapolis, and it looks like mm-hmm. a lot of them did. Sure. Like, if, if they had the same rules that local government has, they would have had a quorum. I'm not going to say who because I haven't confirmed it, but I have been told by some reliable sources that a few of them um, used campaign funds to get there. Ooh. Wow. So that'll be fun. Yeah. I'm not sure how you justify that. Well, you know, first of all, it doesn't matter how they justify it because, like, they're never held accountable. And in the event that they are held accountable or you try to hold them accountable, the accountability entity is like, yeah, it was only like $10 million. We Our threshold is really like 11. So thank you for submitting the complaint. But the, the only positive from that is that show, shows they had to spend their own money and not uh, it wasn't a lobbyist taking them up there. Allegedly. Allegedly. Well, well, if they're taking, if they're taking, oh, wouldn't that be dirty? Lobbyists put money in their account so they can pay to take themselves up, up to Indianapolis. I mean, we act like our ethics laws don't permit that. Like, that's the whole point. I mean, we can make all these things, pass all these these laws and and make all these demands. But at the end of the day, if a lawmaker wants to accept an envelope of cash to do something or a car or have their wife's business get some sort of, you know, promotion. Like they're going to do it. And it, it does, and, and there's nothing we can do to track it. And it just is what it is. Honest people are going to be honest and dishonest people are going to find ways to be dishonest. Yeah. But when you become a lawmaker, dishonesty finds you. Sure. You know, so, somebody who would never think of doing stuff like that and, and somebody else uh, under the dome or, or wh- whichever level of government you're on says, oh, no, you can do this, this and this with that money. And, and you see everybody else doing it. So you think, well, hell, why can't I? But I, I don't know which specific uh, lawmakers you're talking about. And I don't want to know until everything's verified and you can. Put it out on the georgiavirtue.com. Of course, of course. And that's when I'll really find out about it, huh? I mean, maybe I'll give you a hint ahead of time if, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, huh? We'll see. So, did you hear about the deputy from Houston County uh, Sheriff's Office who got canned for a comment on social media? Which I, I assume did. you did because you I, wrote this. I did. I was about to say, I did hear about that, Dave. Tell me about that. <laughs> So this was uh, in regards to the uh, Arbery uh, murder trial sentencing. Uh, <clears throat> Which they all got life. Um, we didn't really talk about it, but I mean, everybody knows at this point they got life. Yeah, two of them get life without parole. One of them get life with the possibility of parole. Which at, at, at their ages, I mean, it's... That'll be uh, the, the the one get life with possibly parole is going to be a, will be a little old man before he ever gets out. Sure. Um, <sighs> so obviously when that news broke, it was everywhere. And I think, I mean, it was all over social media and everything. And there was a comment on one of the news articles, which, I mean, I'll be damned if some of these people, I, it just kills me when I see them comment on public stuff. Like if you want to be opinionated, keep it to your network. It doesn't, it's not a, a surefire thing, but at least if you keep it to your network, you it's it's more limited. But he commented and said, um, you know, that what do you say that uh, that, that criminal, criminal Arbery, right? Yes, yeah, st- st- still got the death penalty though, right? And um, 
the co- someone replied right below it immediately and said, aren't you a Houston County Sheriff's deputy? Um, and sure enough, it was. And I think the guy's profile picture was with him with his canine, uh, police canine. And he was a 20 year deputy. His name's I think, Paul Urhan. Or Urhan, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. But so, of course, in true, uh, you know, woke fashion, it went viral the screenshot and everyone sent it to the media and uh, other media outlets and and shared it in groups and everything. And before you know it, um, he's placed on unpaid leave pending termination. Well, all deputies serve at the pleasure of the sheriff. Yep. Uh, Unlike working for a municipality. Yep. And, and I mean, you're you are an extension of the sheriff by law. Right. Yeah. You're deputized quite right. literally. Right. Oh, man, man, that 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 one's stupid. It was so stupid. Uh, I mean, a 20 year career. I, sure. Of course. Of course. I think the sheriff has the authority to do this. I mean, and I, I if they, he said that it was conduct unbecoming of the, um, the department and unbecoming of an officer and it you know, it violated their policies because it discredited the department. I, and I, I get that. And if, and that is so subjective so that a sheriff or whomever, whenever that's used, can make the decision on their own when they feel like it, because it's their office. I get all that. Do I think that I'm just tired in general of people being terminated and losing their jobs because of social media opinions? Like, Okay, so he put that uh, uh, thing on on social media and told everybody. Um, that's what he really believed. And there are people in this country who believe that. And they work in all different kinds of employment situations. And we don't question it because we don't know. And things continue to move like, okay. So I, I don't know. It's, it's more the, it's the principle of the thing of social media as a whole, not necessarily this specific situation that bugs me. Right. Uh, Twenty years ago, had he said this in a bar, it would it would have been dismissed. It, it, no one would would remember it the next day. But putting it out on social media, it's it's attached to you forever. Most police officers I know and deputies that I know do not use their real name on social media. Yeah, and it, it, that's and there's several reasons for that. One of which being. Uh, you you don't want somebody that you threw in jail finding your family. Mm-hmm. So most of the guys that that I know use their middle name as their last. This this guy was. I'm not saying it, it shouldn't change policy on that, but this probably could have been handled better with showing him the door after 20 years, let him retire. I also think it's strange as, as somebody who spent so much time in, in the private sector of saying uh, his, his firing will be effective January 20th unless he appeals. Well, because most agencies, whether they're local or, you know, or state or how, however it's set up, it doesn't really matter. Um, when someone is terminated, they have 10 days to appeal the decision, 10 business days, because... It gives that window to avoid a lawsuit. Like if there if there's truly something that you can argue against, which this does happen a lot when it's not such a social media firestorm like this, um, they do appeal. It gives them time to retain counsel. And then it's a public process um, for it all to come out. It also gives a window like when they're so you can't get a lot of unless they there's extenuating circumstances. You can't get many of the records related to it for 10 days. Um, like personnel files and stuff like that. They don't allow any of that to be released until it's final. But, you know. Well, you know, <clears throat> stupid thing to say, number one. Uh, I, I said on the show, I don't know, wh- whenever this, this broke, is multiple things can be true at the same time. Arbery could not have been a great guy and he could also not have deserved to be shot and chased down with a pickup truck. But this guy doesn't have the nuance for that. 
So I, I don't I don't know what you do if you're in public life. If you just put your profile, your Facebook profile on private and you only share your thoughts with your circle circle of people, or if you only put up pictures of your kids and just stay out of the opinion space. The chief deputy, he I felt like he was actually the most um dramatic about it. He said that um he had been disciplined in the past for other things over his career, but the firing was based solely on, quote, the destruction of public respect for himself in our department through all of the social media outrage. Um, I get that you're ticked and probably your phones are blowing up and, and everything else. But to say that, first of all, it's kind of a, a smack in the face to everyone else who works for the sheriff's office to say that, um, one guy's social media comments have completely discredited the office. I, I, I don't think that's true. And I honestly have not seen any type of narrative to that effect. But second, like, it, it, that's just not true. Well, and I hate a couple things for this guy. One, his name is very unique. Mm-hmm. So he's obviously post-qualified. You know, he, 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 he has the experience going anywhere else if – Anybody Googles his name, it's going to pop up with this. And any other departments will be like, oh, ooh, yeah, not that one. It's true. So, you know, that, and, I, and I hate that for him. It's one thing to get fired from one job. It's another to get blackballed from the, indus- the, the only industry you've ever known. Oh, he's probably going to be working like private security or something. Yeah, he's, this is, that's it for him. Right. For a while, at least. So we have uh, John Ossoff introduced legislation last week to prohibit members of Congress and their family members from trading stocks while in an elected office. What do you think about this? I was really surprised. I published on the Georgia Virtue last week. And I when I shared the article, I was kind of thinking, like, this is a little bit of an overreach. And the comments were all supportive of it. Everybody's mad that pol- people get in office, Bernie Sanders, uh, Pelosi, and they get in office as thousandaires and, and leave as millionaires. And is there a, a certain amount of insider training? Of course there is. Of course these 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 members of Congress know what legislation is coming down the pike since and- the beginning of time. Right, and, and they're able to make to make moves, whether you know it's a, a spouse's account or anything else. But this would require all members of Congress, their spouses, and dependent children to place their stock portfolios into a blind trust. Family members, I mean, that will never stand. You you can't you can't dependent dependent family members. So this is what the president has to do. The president has to put all of his investments over into a blind trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's I, one. I, I don't think that it's gonna it's gonna hold up. Two. I don't think you can manage it. There, there are just too many of them. That's true. That's true. I and and it's constantly changing. Right. And if you can say, okay, your dependent children can't have it, but your non-dependent dependent children can, um, people are going to use friends. People are going to use uh, uh, companies or, uh, or trusts or whatever else to, to do the same, handle the same business for you. So I don't see where, uh, where this is actually going to change anything. Well, it's like we were talking about at the beginning of the show with campaign donations and everything else. Unethical people are going to do unethical things, and honest people aren't. Right. Well, this is Ossoff trying to make a splash. And look what I'm doing to protect the efficacy of the United States Senate, which... Well, supposedly he and his and the sponsor, Mark Kelly are two of 10 lawmakers who have actually done this. Yeah. And, and look, 
it, this has been done, like you said, since, since day one. I don't, I don't know how to curb it. We can all look at it and say it's wrong. And just like you said, unethical people act, you know, without ethics. So we can all look at that and say, boy, that that's wrong. But to, to hammer out a piece of legislation to make what's unethical illegal, it's, it's hard to put into words what it would take to do that. And how much would it cost us to monitor every yeah. member of commerce, uh, a, a Congress, commerce, Congress? <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? <laughs> commerce. Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, <laughs> and their kids and their spouses. So, like, where do we cut that off? And and I'm I'm as as offended as everybody else that. Uh, Bernie has three or four houses having never worked in the private sector that Nancy Pelosi's become a multi, 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 multi millionaire while in the house. It's obnoxious. Uh, yeah. No one's going to uh, argue that, but. Well, just like we were talking about the previous story, multiple things can be true at the same time. It can be absolutely repugnant. And we can say there's you can't make a law about it, right? So I don't I don't even know if it's constitutional. The the family I feel like that would be easy to to over yeah to to overturn yeah on on that basis because I mean you can't consent in, that you don't get to. Hell, even a wife might not agree for her husband to run for. I mean, Jody Heiss thinks. Okay, so I guess it's different for men and women because Jody Heiss thinks that women can run for office as long as their husband says it's okay. So I guess in their sense, the husband would be consenting. But on the other side, you know, a woman doesn't necessarily have to consent for a man to run for office per Jody. So, you know. What the hell you say? <laughs> I've been told I'm not running. And well, I obey. Here's the other thing. Like, Congress isn't the only group of insiders, right? Like, lawmakers all over and elected officials all over know things. And, like, you're kind of punishing Congress. I mean, I don't think we shouldn't, but, like, you're leaving out a lot of bad actors. Well, and to the point of the legislation – it's already illegal for people who are in certain industries to invest in certain industries. The, yeah. Like they have to, they have to turn their finances over to a blind trust uh, and have n- no personal interaction with the people. Uh, I've got a friend whose whose wife uh, is a big wig at one of the major firms, and you know when I, when he and I talk stocks, he just has a smile on his face because. I can't do anything about it because because of what my wife does, so, and, and he's happier for it. But that is, you know, interesting on, on that point that there are other professionals that are prohibited from trading stocks or what stocks they can trade, and that's that's from the FTC, the the, the Trade Commission. Yeah, I just. But this is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over at thegeorgiavirtue.com. So Kemp gave his State of the State last Thursday. He did. Did you um, read it or watch it or did you get catch any articles about it or anything? I did not. I did not. Uh, I got what you sent me to read. <laughs> yeah. So it was about, I mean, it was like a 40 minute speech. I don't, I don't think it was overly, I, I feel like Governor Deal um, had went well beyond that often when he was in office and it was it was tough, but um, Kemp, I he's just made a a ton of promises. I mean, he he did spend a lot of time talking about how you know Georgia 
had seen a lot of success because of um, the way we handled COVID. And we've talked about that on the show. I mean, we I think we were relatively blessed um, considering the other states, how they handled it. But um, he talked about that. He talked about economic development, the jobs that have been brought here. And of course, all the things that we've literally talked about on the show for the last three and a half years um, that he has under his administration or through his floor leaders pushed across, you know, different subjects and agencies. But he, he spent a lot of time making promises about crime, children, money, taxes. Uh, I mean, we're going to go into them by like one by one, but I, I know it's an election year, but Holy hell. I mean, well, Kemp's also in a fight. He is, and and that ticks me off as well because I feel like we're going to talk about some things um, and have some things be a priority that really shouldn't be a priority because of it, and that's obnoxious. Um, but yeah, but so but, but we understand what things happen during election years, and and what doesn't. Like. I would be very surprised to see the pay races go through for lawmakers because it's it's an election year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know he's hammering on on gang legislation. He is. He wants to create a task force. So we've talked about it before. There's a GBI task force, and I think I want to say that it was in um, 2020, maybe before or. Um, or maybe it was implemented, or passed in 2019 and then implemented. But it's this big Vic Reynolds thing because, you know, he was a prosecutor and a cop a long time ago, and which is ironic because he sucks as a GBI director, but whatever. He They have this task force that is the anti-gang task force, and it, it works with agencies, and it's just like all the other tasks for, task force where, you know, it's multi-jurisdictional and, and all that. Well, now we apparently we need one. We need funding to create one in the attorney general's office to complement what's been established in the GBI. Why? Why do we need that? Like if, if GBI and their task force is doing all the work and you have attorneys in the attorney general's office, why don't you just assign a prosecutor? Why do you need to unit? Why do you need to formalize this? Like, it, it, I don't I don't understand. Yeah. It, so you can put your name on something. I Gang task force and stuff like that. I mean, I I get the G, GBI may may need that, but to to duplicate it is is pointless. It, you have two different units doing the same job, working parallel to each other, and sometimes working against each other if they're trying to turn whatever informants against each other. Well, I don't it's know, just man. it makes no sense. Like if you're going to have investigators in Chris Carr's office, like. The the why is the protocol not to just have the attorney general's office contact someone in the GBI? Like if they well, are well, funded, yeah. you know. Yeah, like that's, we what, already- that's what. Yeah, that's the that's the thing is the 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 uh, Chris Carr's office already has investigators. They're called the GBI, right? And you 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 hand that sort of stuff over to I don't know a law enforcement agency. Yeah, I know that sounds crazy. Investigators, investigators for DA's office and and solicitor. I mean, most a lot of solicitors' offices don't have investigators, but some do. But that in, in an attorney general's office, they are not supposed to like go out and just find new things to pursue. There's supposed to be a check on the agency that did the investigation or that took out the warrants or however it started, so that they can ensure that they have what they need to go forward for prosecution. So if, right. if you follow holding, that logic, holding the, the executive branch accountable right. for, for, for its actions. Absolutely. So if it's, you have that mindset and that structure, which is what it's supposed to be, this is totally unnecessary, but Chris you know, Carr already told you he doesn't work for you. He does. He has told, he has told me that sp- personally and, and a bunch of other people as well. And he says it on the, all his literature, but, um, you know, they, 
they Kemp said that the oversight is needed because in too many jurisdictions across the state, soft on crime, local governments and prosecutors have been unwilling to join our fight to rid the communities of these criminal networks. I don't disagree. I don't disagree that there's a um, a discrepancy and a lack of um what is the word i'm looking for not cohesiveness but parity in how people or how cities and counties uh, go after crime but you know what oh well like if you want to live in atlanta and it's crime ridden then live in atlanta and deal with well the that's crime. that's that's the whole idea of being a small government conservative is the Government closest to the people governs best. So if that's what the people of Atlanta want. Let them have it. God bless. Let you know, the it's... Lord's will be done. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's what we they chose their their own government. They they elect their own DA. New York is a uh, is an interesting study in which they elected a very loose on crime DA and a very tough on crime mayor. Yeah, I just So I, I don't know. I, I don't know I, I don't know this is the, the right thing for for the state, but again, election year. Mm-hmm. Uh he wants to spend seven million to upgrade GBI crime lab and hire more know. crime lab technicians. Well, okay, so the crime lab, t- crime lab technician thing is to perform more autopsies. I don't actually have a problem with that because the backlog is insane. Like, I think I've talked about it on the show, um, the, the murder for hire case that was organized from a state prison. The autopsy report is not done from 12 months ago, and I think that's obnoxious. I mean, obviously, they've done the autopsy. They just haven't done the report, but they're overwhelmed, and they don't have enough people, and you know, drug testing and and uh, evidence processing takes far too long, and that slows down the court process. I don't have a problem with that. Why we need to upgrade the crime labs, I'm not sure. The one in Pooler is like three years old, I think, at the most. Um, well, but- upgrade could be technology or, or whatever else. I, I, I'm with you here. I don't really have a problem with it. Um, having waited on a, a uh, an autopsy to come down, I mean, it, it takes months to get a talk screen back. And and part of that is just the time it takes you to the talk screen. Really? But, uh, it, there, there is a period of time that, you know, it, you, people watch too much CSI and, and NCIS where you don't get the talk screen in two days. It, it, it takes a while. But mm-hmm. the, the GBI lab also takes care of all the county deaths that don't have MEs. So where I live, Paulding County, for example, we have a uh, uh, we have a coroner. The coroner is not a medical professional. Coroner, her recommend her uh, requirements are graduate high school. So cool. any anything that is uh, uh, requires a uh, an autopsy, it has to go to the GBI lab. Right. And that's all over the state. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a backlog. We don't have enough people. Whatever. Fine. Cool. Um, yeah, and he, and he could have left it at that. Yeah. We, we don't have enough didn't. people. But he didn't. He could didn't. have left it at that. He didn't because he wants more funding for additional state trooper classes. And he wants to ask our technical colleges to offer tuition-free law enforcement and criminal justice degrees. So here's a couple things. First of all, a lot of our – we had a we had tech schools that were offering – they weren't for free, but they were offering law enforcement um, certification and programs. And the tech school system shut them down three years ago. They shut down several of them. I, I like we had we used to have over a dozen and now there's fewer than maybe maybe eight or something other than the state funded ones. So um, pardon me while I just watch you roll back what you undid because now it sucks. Um Second, (laughs) 
I mean, I like, I, I don't know why you just don't come out and say what you feel. I know, I know, but I mean, like, it's it's like we do this all the time. The state does this all the time. We we implement something and then it creates a problem. And five years later, we're like, we have the tools to fix the problem. Yeah, because you freaking created it. That's the game, Jessica. Well, that's the game. Is you create a problem and then you create a solution. So Ugh. he's going to help the children. How is that? Well, um, for starters, he wants to uh, ban transgender girls from playing sports in school. We we talked about this one a little bit last year because of um, Philip Singleton and his bill that he had that really, I mean, it got some press, but it didn't get any attention because Ralston hates Singleton. Um, and you're saying Ralston is, is punitive? No. I know. It's hard to believe. But um, And then he wants to create a parent's bill of rights, which I oppose. I oppose the police officer's bill of rights. I oppose the, oppose the crime victim's bill of rights. Like, we have a bill of rights. It's in the United States Constitution. And nobody else should get special privileges under the law. Parents, like, if you don't like what your school is doing, then homeschool your kid or send them to a school that aligns with your values this is not a complicated concept well the the last one to me being the worst removing obscene materials from school libraries and online resources they don't even know what that means nobody knows what that means no you can't legislate that same i I mean we're mm. i am so of worried about banning books. It, it's, it, it all depends on who decides what's obscene. Is Huck Finn obscene? What about To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, I mean, what's the definition of obscene? Right. So well, we all we all have this picture in our head of, of porn. And no, I don't want kids getting getting onto a porn website sitting in the school library. Of course I, not. But obscene is defined as offensive to moral principles and something that is repugnant. Right. And it's moral purposely principles. loose. So you can show the statue of David by Michelangelo, and that's not obscene. It, nor should it be. So, you know, those those definitions are written in such a way that you can show art. You can show paintings by Kirby. You can show uh, Michelangelo's work. Uh, kids need to have ac- uh, access to that. They need to be able to see it to understand uh, the Renaissance, to understand the the renewed renaissance in the 20s you need to, they need to be able to understand that and still we say we don't want them watching porn in the in the school library which that, they're not overwhelmingly not they all have they all have uh, no they're porn. doing it at home while their parents are busy on their phones because they're not paying attention to their kids yeah they have a porn machine in their hand i mean it every kid's got a, got a got a smartphone i mean they have a porn machine in their hand so I, I don't I, I other than just purely playing to the electorate, I don't know what this fixes. All this does is add the ability to take things out of the curriculum that we we all read when when, when I was a kid. You know, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Catcher in the Rye, you know, books like that because they have an obscene word in there or uh, Huck Finn or anything like that. Because they have obscene words in them and and remove kids' access to the American classics. Well, and, you know, I had – there was a controversy when I was in – it was in ninth grade. It was one of the required reading books. I think it was The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And it, it mentioned um, – I mean, there was – I think there was some um, homosexual relationships in there. I think. Um, and then I, I'm pretty sure there were some sexual instances. Now, I'm not a parent right now. However, I don't think this would change if I were. and Because if I were a parent right now in this day and age, I would be far less concerned 
with my child reading about sex than reading about or being in in indoctrinated and told about how they should be, you know, suck off the system for their whole life. Well, lack of a better phrase. You would also want the opportunity to put in perspective to your children what you can though. Right, exactly. Uh, You can, and teachers should be doing this. Is and parents should be doing this. Well, yeah, but if if there's something assigned to a kid, everything should be put into perspective. Is understand why the author used the language that he did. Why did Mark Twain use a, a completely offensive term to refer to to somebody? Why? And it's in. It's the understanding of the evolution of this this young person who, you know, learns to understand that somebody who's different from him is a human being. It's the it's the evolution of his thought. But you can't get to that point until you understand where he started. Yeah, but that's because we don't allow teachers. The same people who want to teach this stuff don't allow teachers to have the, t- the contextual conversations about it. They're mad when the teacher shares anything more than this was this was abhorrent and we've corrected this and get woke. Get woke or delete those things from the text and let kids read an abridged version of, of whatever piece of liter- literature it is. It's It does nobody any good to take that out. We need to understand history. We need to understand where we came from. We can only appreciate where we are if we can understand where we came from. Well, it's almost offensive and we're, we're kind of like sticking a little long on this topic, I know, but, you know, it, it, it it's border, the school systems around the state are dealing with this on a, not just annual basis, but monthly like their board meeting like this is and it's not just critical race theory which is something that we'll talk about in a minute but it's all the stuff that's in the curriculum they're they're having to address this all the time and every district is different every district wants different things and it's it's kind of like laughable but a little bit offensive that our lawmakers think they can pick a, a few words to succinctly write this quote wrong Oh, exactly. And these are all things that uh, people my age and older read, uh, uh, had an appreciation for how they were written, uh, and gives us perspective as to as to where we've come from. Uh, he also wants to provide a $1.6 billion uh, in tax refunds to all Georgia taxpayers. Hold on. Pump the brakes. You forgot one. He wants to add $425 million to schools for the fiscal year 2023 to reduce class size and hire more teachers. Yeah. um, Is there a teacher shortage? (laughs) Not that I've seen. I don't think there's a teacher shortage. And and the money doesn't do it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be a teacher right now, would you? Yeah, but it had nothing to do with money. Yeah, it's, it's not a money thing. It's a, uh, I, I don't want the scrutiny. Plus, I would last about, I don't know, a week as a teacher before they fired me. Uh, I don't think class size is is the problem. Uh, we demonstrated this with the guy that started Captive Air. I can't remember what the name of his, his uh, schools are. The one in, in, in North Carolina we talked about on the show. Mm-hmm. Class size is not the issue. It's grouping of children by ability. So kids all with the same uh, reading level are going to read at the, at the same level. And you could teach that class with 50 kids in the room. It's when you have all these different ability levels because we're not allowed to look at that anymore. Uh as a friend of mine, he's got a very intelligent daughter, uh, said they're not allowed to call themselves the smart kids anymore because it makes other kids feel bad. So we can't group those those abilities so they can all move forward together. The The class size is, is irrelevant if 
you don't have to slow the entire class down for the, for, for the slowest kid. And that may sound insensitive, but it's the same thing with, you know, like we talked about it with, with, with that, with that university and private schools is uh, if, if uh, we're all working out together, we're all using the same weights. If, if we have to use the least amount of weight for the person who that that's their max, no one is going to get better. The problem though, is that this is, something that's being said to appease the teachers unions and the those groups of people that are not going to vote for him anyway this is a talking point for them our classes are too large we need this we need that it doesn't matter it's not going to change anything um like this is it's, it's a waste of your time it's a waste of everybody's time sorry it is but he's been buying off the teachers since day one Thinking that somehow he's going to get the teachers on his side, and I know this is this is a Brian Kemp thing. And, and look, I truly believe that he believes he's looking after the teachers, mm-hmm. and that he's. I, I truly, I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, he's going to give him another freaking two grand, and then he's talking about maybe maybe including them in the five thousand dollar increase for state employees. I mean, it's never going to be enough. He's going to right. But but I, I I think he believes that he's being pro teacher here. It, it's just it, it's it's absurd. Uh, if he was able to detach himself from his emotions a little bit, he might be able to look at that and say, "Well, this is stupid. We don't need you know half a billion dollars to get more teachers. We need teachers who are allowed to teach." Mm-hmm. Uh, extend Medicaid coverage to uh, mothers after birth for. Uh, from the recently uh, approved six months to a year. This is in response to the heartbeat bill because Democrats criticized him and said, you know, if you are going to force women to have babies, then you should take care of them when they do. That's that's exactly what this is. Um, and again, like, OK, n- n- noble, super noble, uh, if you, you know, if that's what you want to do, but you aren't going to get the people that want are demanding you do this. You're not there. If someone is, you're just not, no one, you're not getting, it's not happening. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing is you can't, a Republican cannot buy himself into the hearts of, of liberals. That's just the way it is. You need to stay principled. And honestly, the Republican party has a real problem with staying principled. Well, you can't keep up. You cannot keep up with what Democrats want to hand out. I mean, this is here. I'll I'll make my point in saying that their response to Kemp's state of the state was that he didn't talk about anything important and that he should have he should instead be talking about raising the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour in the public and private sector. He should be um, expanding rural broadband and implementing subsidized broadband for people and that um Everything else is just political football. And the Democratic Party of Georgia issued this long statement just blistering him. And I I mean, I don't necessarily agree, but like they're just talking about things that he's not. And it's a losing battle. Well, it's like trying to nail down Jell-O is, you know, you can't out buy the Democrats. You can be principled. And you can stand up and and be proud of who you are as a person, but this is not what's happening. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the other stuff he wants to do: introduce legislation to exempt retirement income for veterans. Every how year about, it comes up. How about exempting everybody from the from the income tax? Uh, ensure at least well, 90%. Well, Butch Miller wants to do that. Yeah, yeah. Th- there are a few up there that want to do it. It'll never get past Ralston. Uh, ensure that at least 90% of tuition for HOPE scholarship uh, recipients uh, at all public post-secondary education institutions is covered by the scholarship program. I, every time I hear about HOPE from a politician, it's going broke. Maybe that's a sign that it's not sustainable. Maybe it's a sign that the government shouldn't be in the casino business. 
Oh, that's getting a little out there. <laughs> I loved how this was all reported, though. The Associated Press um, did a rundown on what Kemp said in his ad- address, and they said that I, the quote was, he's bombarding public school teachers and employees with money. And and he is, like, I mean, I don't disagree, but, like, dude, you, like, the media is liberal. We know this. They lean left. They they always paint things that there's not enough money. And then he freaking does what you want, and you report that he's bombarded. Like, that has a negative connotation to it. Bombarding people with money. Bombarding teachers who say we shouldn't have to buy our own supplies we shouldn't have to do this we work too hard we don't have this we need this we want this we need this blah 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 and now you're bombarding them because you're going to give them a raise you're going to give them money you've given them a bonus and you're going to give them 125 dollars from federal stimulus money to go buy supplies like you it, it god it's ridiculous no it never ends but you're mad that he's doing what you like. You still can't even report fairly that what he's doing when he's doing what you you have demanded for the last three years. Because you cannot appease them. It, it, it's like I just said, you stand on principle and go from there. And look, if if, if I'm in the governor's mansion and I stand on principle and I get sent home, that's just the way it is. Amen. But at least I can look myself in the mirror and say I stood on principle. I I don't know how Republicans don't understand this. That you will never be able to outbuy the Democrats. If you say you should give teachers four hundred million, uh, and the Democrats say, well, we want to give them eight hundred million, it, it doesn't matter. That you will never outbuy them. You're going to have to stand on principle. Then you look nuts proposing those types of things while simultaneously proposing things like what we're about to talk about, you know, with regard to banning critical race theory or addressing um, transgender things like we were were talking about before. I mean, like when you go from the extreme on both sides, it it looks nuts. Well, yeah, that brings us to HB... Uh, 888, banning of critical race theory in public schools. Mm -hmm. Representative Brad Thomas filed it. Um, And, you know, we've talked about critical race theory. We've talked about the 1619 project on the show at length. And um, we've also talked about the fact that there is not a single school system in Georgia that is teaching critical race theory under the name critical race theory. Like, if they do, it, they have different terms, and you're never going to, they'll just, if you want to put this in legislation, they're just going to change the name. Well, it also goes into the same thing we're talking about books. It is totally appropriate to discuss uh, the inequities that our country has had in the past. Uh you know, from my from my standpoint, it's it's mostly economic, but we have to be able to have the conversation about Jim Crow and everything else. Is especially in high school and colleges, things like that. You need to be able to discuss how Jim Crow has affected where we are today, and that's a that's a valid conversation to have. It's a valid debate to have within the classroom, but. Banning something based on its title, nah, it's absurd. Even though I certainly don't believe in the 1619 Project, and I think critical, critical race theory, the macro view of it is is pretty lousy. Well, you know what's hilarious, too, and I've talked about this on the show with you about um, how unaccountable our state school board is that's appointed by the governor, but... You know, this isn't really like under the Constitution, the state Constitution, this is the responsibility, arguably, you know, the curriculum would be would be the legislature's responsibility. But the way that our legislature has continuously um, delegated authority, its own authority to the governor and then with, you know, opportunity school districts and then with the state school board, 
they actually gave this responsibility to the state school board and had no business handling it at this point, which is funny because they've all supported it. And now they're like, oh, crap, we got to do something. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. And that's at every level of level of government. You know, the the legislature has given away its its authority. We're supposed to have three equal branches of government. And the legislative branch has bled that out because they don't want to have to actually do anything. They whether it's whether it's Congress or state legislatures that do this, they, they they've given away their authority because they don't want to they don't want to be held accountable every two years. So they can give that authority over to the governor or over to the president and and then throw their hands up and go, I can't believe he did that. Yeah. And, and, and it's been systematic over the last 150 years that, that we've seen this transfer of power over to the executive branch. The executive branch was never meant to have this much authority. We were not supposed to be a dictatorship. Yet here we are. <laughs> Yet here we are. Well, Jess, as we are starting to get uh, close to the end, it looks like you've got a pretty good closing thought. Yeah, it's not. It won't take too long. But I did. Um, this isn't something that's new. I, I know that there's articles on it from the past couple of years, but it was new to me. And I read a story about um, the community in Antarctica, um, the Villas Las Estrellas, which is one of two civilizations on the continent um, where people actually live. Um, they said there's like 150 people there in the summer and 80 in the winter because um, it can drop to negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, in the winter. But anyway, to live there, it is a requirement, whether you're like in research or you are one of the teachers or whatever, um, that you have to have your appendix removed to live there. Like you can't have an appendix because the nearest hospital is 625 miles away. Um, And then they also discourage pregnancy and you are required to stay inside like can't even go building to building um, between like the winter months when it drops so low and the summer is only 36 degrees. So it's definitely not a place I could live. Also, they don't allow dogs because they don't want dogs to like infect or risk infecting um, local wildlife, which I'm not sure what kind of research they're doing down there. But like dogs usually don't. I've never seen a dog mate with another species, but whatever um anyway it's a no for me but the town and the, also the town i couldn't work from there because the town only has internet at the three computers that are at the school but it's just fascinating to me i i found i read this story about re- requirement to have your appendix removed to live there and then which is just funny because you know you could have all kinds of medical emergencies like preemptively removing your appendix like that's just not on the, well, the scale like Interesting but, about that is we have found in the last 50 years that the appendix is actually a useful organ. It's not just a throwaway. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I don't know what to say about that, but. Well, good thing it's cold because no one's going to wear a bikini because everybody's going to have an appendix scar. Oh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Jessica, are you over my crap today? <laughs> oh, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> no, it's an interesting story. It's uh, Antarctica is is an interesting place. Being a uh, without without being a country, you know. It's so it, yes, we should do a show on Antarctica, or you should do it on surf and turf and something because they send ships and cruises and stuff down there. I first of all, like I grew up in a time where nobody lived there. I mean, I know that they've been doing stuff since the eighties, but like they didn't talk about people living there. But there's a treaty there that says that like because this community is a community of um, Chile, and there's another one that's in Argent, like based off. I of bet Argentina. it is Chile. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Oh my God. And we have uh, bases like the U.S. has some stuff there, too. But we like everyone has signed an accord basically saying that like nobody is the authority there. 
nobody has settled, nobody, like they've signed this treaty. So, okay, so I guess there's no police. Like what happens if someone tries to murder you? Yeah, I, I don't know. I I mean, I assume they murder you back. But yeah, it's, it I is. I said tries. <laughs> But yeah, it's it, it, Antarctica is interesting in that there's a, you know, like you mentioned, the treaty that it kind of belongs to everyone. Yeah. Without belonging to anyone. So yeah, that, that's a interesting story. I, I, I'm certainly not going to move somewhere where the highs in summer are 36. Well, no, you couldn't work. No, I could make a killing off of heat. Well, that's true. Um, you should look at the pictures of this town too, this community. Like they're all these, um, like manufactured, um, like shipping container type houses and, and trailers. Like it's not, it's not pretty. Well, no, I mean, it's beautiful. The background is beautiful, but it, no, it's definitely not pretty, but you know, I hope they have good insulation on the other side because generally those are not ext- like that warm. Yeah, Connexes do not offer much protection against the outdoors. No. I mean, against wind, yeah, but as far as it's going to be a negative 100 degrees, yeah, you got to generate a bunch of heat to keep that sucker warm. I would complain all the time. You complain all the time now. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> I would love well, it there because there's no government. I would just be miserable because it's cold. <laughs> and you couldn't take the dogs. Correct. So that's a deal breaker right there. Correct. Go. So how could I introduce you as dog mom? Well, you couldn't because I couldn't do the podcast because there's no internet there. <laughs> that's true too. Uh, the only thing I have is in in my personal life uh, lost a a uh, family friend who was uh, what we called a backdoor neighbor when I was growing up, which means the back door was never locked and, you know, they could come and go and we went, you know, could come and go in their house as much as we wanted to. Uh, he was a, uh, uh, army veteran, Vietnam veteran. And the, the regret I have, because I, I never really appreciated what he did when I was a kid. He, he was just uncle Fred, just, just the way it was. I mean, it just, yeah, to me, he was just a goofy, lighthearted guy. Uh, but, you know, he was, a, as I recall, a door gunner in Vietnam. And it wasn't until I got in the Army that I realized how horrible of a job that was. And I never, because we always think we have more time, uh, never set the time aside to sit down and talk to him. Mm-hmm. You know, we obviously interacted when I was a kid. We interacted with my parents at their 50th anniversary party. But I never sat down one-on-one just to get his experiences and so much of that died with him and it's it's something that that we need to do and i'm you know not waxing philosophic here but talk to these people learn their perspective uh i know I talked to my grandmother briefly about her experiences in the Great Depression, and she had some great stories, uh, but never really got a chance to sit down and appreciate what she was talking about. Uh, My grandfather served in uh, uh, the Marine Corps in World War II, was in Okinawa, and was an officer in Korea. And I never really took the time to sit down and talk to these people and absorb their knowledge and their perspective of what they went through. And it's not till we till we lose people that that we kind of lose that ability or, or kind of view the fact that oh man I really missed an opportunity. Yeah. And I know That's my sad. closing thoughts are usually more cheery than that. <laughs> That's okay. It's personal, and you're allowed to take. Points, moments of personal privilege. So, yeah, and 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 I struggled as to whether to even mention it on the show, uh, but I I thought it was it was good enough if you know if somebody hears that and says you know what I need to sit down and talk to my dad I need to sit down and talk to my grandfather. Right, I agree. So, anyway, 
for Jessica Salaji, my partner on this endeavor, for Eric Cumby, our awesome editor that turns absolute crap into something you can listen to. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Catch me howling at the moon